This week we are in the friendly confines of the Midwest. Good people, good food, great football. We talk Michigan game, facility upgrades, and managing high expectations. First stop on this double episode week is in Columbus with the Ohio State University Athletic Director, Ross Bjork. Buckeye fans, check out our sponsor, 500level.com, the best t-shirts and sports on the internet. All the Buckeye greats have amazing shirts on 500 level. Garrett Wilson, Nick Bosa, Scary Terry, Terry McLaurin of the Commanders. Check it out, 500level.com, 20% off everything on the site with the discount code DK and RIP. That's D-K-A-N-D-R-I-P. Let's go. This is Ross Bjork from The Ohio State University. So proud to be on One Star Recruits. Yo, aloha. Welcome to the podcast. Dropping two episodes this week with two exclusive interviews because, Rip, it only makes sense. We wouldn't do this if it doesn't make sense. I don't think we'd be doing this if we had a Arizona State University, U of A, University of Arizona rivalry going on. I don't know if we'd even do it. I don't even know if we do it for a Yankees Red Sox. Rip, we have college football coming up. This makes perfect sense. You're right. And just how the calendar fell, we happened to have these interviews on back to back days last week. Ward Manuel of Michigan and Ross Bjork of Ohio State even got a little trash talk from them. Even the new guy, Ross Bjork, talking a little trash to Ward on the interview. So it's a it's a good week for it. College football is a few weeks away, DK. I'm excited and I'm happy to do this first ever double episode for these fan bases. Right around the corner, college football, that is. You know, you and, my, you and I have been all around the the nation, the country, getting inside look at the best programs in the country through the eyes and ears of the athletic director. It's been an interesting view to look through this telescope because it's like one of those kaleidoscopes, you know, as an AD. You think you know what's going on. You think the job description is what it was. Then you look through that kaleidoscope of perspective and and change and it's like one of those uh, those crazy prints inside of there. It's, it's, it's a little bit wild. Times are changing is what I'm saying, Rip. I mentioned job description. It's, it's, been, it's been really interesting to hear from them that change. It's like one-star style. We're in the midst of, of this change right now, and the athletic directors have a front row seat. I mean, if you don't believe us that things are getting weird in this revenue generation front, this new world order of monetization, in college sports, look no further than this week to the new home of, of Florida International Football, Rip. Pitbull Stadium, not the dog. Pitbull, the artist. Finding a way to squeeze that money. We talk about it in this interview with big-time schools. Here's an innovative way to look at it. You hear about this deal, Rip? You hear about the new Pitbull Stadium? You got any numbers on that? How much are they? How much is, is he paying to, to call that stadium Pitbull nowhere, Stadium. Nowhere close what it would be to name the Horseshoe or the Big House, obviously. But Pitbull got a deal, I think. Five-year, $6 million deal, so just over a million dollars a year. What, do you, what is he getting in return? Naming rights, obviously. Kind of cool, you know? Not worth the investment, but there's more. He's getting uh, 305 Vodka sold at the games. His product, product placement in arena. Two suites for up to 40 people. So catch that dude at some games. And then he also gets used to the venue. For another 10 days so you get creative this is what i'm talking about bro the job description has has changed oh yeah i think pitbull also receives the title of official entrepreneur of fiu athletics so he's naming himself what he wants through the school program this is a small example of what's happening when i say shit is changing a little bit I feel like it actually is worth the investment because if you put a value on all the social media advertising and attention that he's getting from this, like we're talking about it right now, it's exponentially going out to our listeners who may not have heard of it. And he's the first one to do it. That's always worth something. So a million bucks almost sounds like a bargain to me. It's fun. I'm into it. No, no haters here. No haterade being drank over here on this side. No lemon lime haterade. What is not changing is the rivalry and dislike, though, between Michigan and Ohio State, and everything. It's not just football. This includes the athletic directors. And I know they're very respectful and, and, and professional, but it's just, it's just a Hatfield and McCoy situation, and it has been, and it will be. And that's great. It's what it's all about. The Big Ten has a fresh new look. It's top-heavy, Rip. It's a geographical disaster, to be honest. It's basically the richest conference in college sports. So here we go again. Things continue to get weird. 
the new conference map hit the internet last week. I don't know if you saw it, Rip. I had to watch it three times. It feels so off. Did you see the release of the of the Big Ten map? Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot more air miles being traveled, being collected by by these players and these coaches, and it's going to be interesting, man. We got we know the big game on, on the Ohio State schedule. Aside from the big game, it's going to be October 12th at Oregon. Ohio State at Oregon. I think the cheapest ticket for that game right now is like $700, standing room only. It's unbelievable. And then if you look at Michigan's schedule, they have three huge opponents come to the big house. We got Texas, September 7th, and week two. USC a couple weeks later, September 21st, in Ann Arbor. And Oregon coming on November 2nd. That's unbelievable. And then, of course, the big game on November 30th. It's going to be a banner year for Michigan. What a heck of a schedule that is. College football fans, you wanted, how can you not get excited about this? Oregon, UCLA, USC, and Washington, new members. We have new members. The USA Today coaches poll is out. Ohio State checking in at number two ranked team behind number one, Georgia. Michigan knocking, coming in at number eight, right there in the top 10. Rivalry continues. Things continue. First look, Rip, at the uh, new offensive coordinator, Chip Kelly. We've seen him out in L.A. We know his NFL story. Could this be the the, the position that, that Chip Kelly's been waiting for to reignite his, his success? He lost it a little bit. We'll be able to check him out at the end of the month. They play Akron. High expectations, though, for Brian Day and the Buckeyes on both sides of the ball based on the roster that they have returning, essentially. Some real ballers to keep an eye on. Emeka at wide receiver. Judkins running back. Will Howard has high expectations at quarterback. And then you still got Caleb Downs, Denzel Burke holding it down for the secondary. Enjoy this interview with Ohio State Athletic Director, Ross Bjork. Now joining the One Star Recruits podcast, we have a husband, a father, a native of Dodge City, Kansas, the starting fullback for the 1994 Emporia State Hornets, and the current senior president and director of athletics at Ohio State University, Ross Bjork, is on with the One Star Recruits. Thanks for hopping on, Ross. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, and Enjoy that intro. Uh, you got the most important titles right. Dad, dad and husband. So thank you for d- including that. Always love to start off with that. And and speaking of that, just a quick full circle kind of thing here. Emporia State, I believe, was an NAIA school during your two years there. And now, however many years later, your oldest son is a freshman wide receiver at Tarleton State, which I think is an FCS school. What's some advice or a lesson that you've given to your son about embarking on that journey at a, at a smaller size football school? Well, uh, I, that's a that's a great question. I really appreciate that because uh, you look being being a college football player um, is not my identity, but it's my pathway. And so there's so many lessons that I still take today that because I was a football player that I that I've learned from. And so to have my son, you know, now being a college football player and uh, starting practice and, you know, what, what I do tease him about is, look, we had two a days. We had real two a days. Now they have one practice and then they have a walkthrough and then they have meetings. That's weak. I mean, we had to <laughs> go through like six hours a day of hitting each other. Uh, but no, just to kind of come full circle, like you said, to have a son that plays, you know, college athletics, to be a product of this. Uh, one of the things that parents learn quickly is that your kids tune you out. They don't they don't listen to me. They don't they don't. Dad, uh, dad is not very smart when it comes to parent advice or coaching advice. Somebody else is. But what does happen is they'll tell me, hey, a coach said this. And I remember when you said this and I'm like, okay, maybe we do know what we're talking about after all. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe I've been around this long enough where I I can have a few, uh, you know, opinions based on my experience. Uh, But no, there's nothing better than being a parent and to see your kids flourish around sports and to see their commitment level and to see their hard work. It's uh, it's just really gratifying in, in so many ways. It's so cool, Matt. You can definitely teach them a pancake block. I bet. How's your pancake block? I, One out of ten. I would say uh, I would say eight, eight to nine was my pancake block. I always look. I'm not that tall, <laughs> but I mean, I, I weighed I weighed 235, 240 pounds at, at my peak. Wow. And I always could say, look, if I could get kind of my the nose of my face mask kind of right in the sternum, 
like right in the chest, then that's where I, that's where I had them because no one wants to be hit there, right? They're always going to kind of flinch over, right? And so that if I could kind of get that leverage point, then I usually could uh, could maneuver them around enough to to maybe have that pancake block. So there we go, listeners. The football fun. guy talk. That football right. guy talk has begun. They're right, right in the sternum rip. We're we're here. <laughs> Ohio State, it's the opposite of a small school. In fact, you just took a, a deep dive last week of the horseshoe. Such a historic place, Ohio Stadium, a massive stadium. But it hasn't seen any significant upgrades or renovations since 2001. A lot of schools are the same. You know, this isn't this isn't just an Ohio State thing. But a lot of Buckeyes fans, you know this, are they're clamoring for upgrades, news. People love renderings. What are your initial yeah. thoughts or ideas as you did the walkthrough of, of needs or wants to be tackled first and yeah. keeping Ohio stadium up to date. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. You, you followed my Twitter feed. It sounds like, and yeah, I did get some there comments back. Uh, I think one, one person said it needs about $1.2 billion worth of upgrades. And, <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, Hey, that might, might not be too far off uh, from a number standpoint. If you look at what Penn state is going through with their renovation or Nebraska, you know, these, uh, these stadiums, especially the older stadiums are are not cheap if you uh, add on or, or renovate. And so, you know, really the, the tour that I did is, you know, one for an assessment, of course, uh, two, I want to learn the history uh, of that type of uh, facility and obviously over a hundred year old building. And there's still pieces of it that are original um, and, and real rooms that haven't really been touched uh, sort of back of house things, obviously the concrete, the archways, uh, the way they did the forms on the concrete, I mean, they're basically look like sort of six inch wide boards and you can still see how the concrete form versus in modern era, it's all flat. And there's, I mean, it's really, really fascinating how they built that stadium. So it was a history lesson for me, but then you're right. You're, you're thinking about, wow, that's a space we could renovate. That's a space we could turn into a premium area right now. The, I'd say the need and sort of the, the urgency would be around how do we generate revenue in that building? Uh, we only have one club area. And so we're actually looking at a club area on the east side of the stadium. We have an area that was an academic area. It's sort of a staging area now for construction projects. That's a whole space that we could capture and make a premium space. So I, I think about how to drive revenue. Uh, do you do things around the field? You know, those kind of things. You're not going to change the history of Ohio Stadium. It is what it is. So you got to protect the tradition. You got to protect the historical value. There's pieces of it that are historical in nature that you, anytime you touch it, even if it's paint, you have to go through a whole process, the rotunda area, right? And so you, you know, you got to do a little bit of surgery. You got to do a little bit of sort of really long range master planning, but facilities in the modern era have to drive revenue. And then in that stadium, the infrastructure cost just to have the mechanical, the electrical and all those things operate. Deferred maintenance is kind of the category. Those are going to take constant evaluation and we're going to have to constantly pour money into the stadium just to keep a hundred year old stadium just active. Um, so those are all the things that I think about when I think about Ohio Stadium and, and walking in there. And then really just overall, what were they thinking back in the 1920s? to build a stadium that big. What was it's the vision? Form. Yeah. Really, really fascinating to, to be in their mind to say, why did they build it that big? What did they see that maybe no one else saw? Really fascinating. It's a really cool angle. I, I appreciate it. It's it, you're right. And it is an art form. It almost is a science when you get, when you dig into um, the history side of it, as well as the upgrades. Thank you for talking about that. I don't think those two worlds have to merge and although that might slow down the program, the, the the process a bit, I think this day and age everybody wants quickness. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. Do you think twelve to eighteen months we'll see some development, or we're looking at a longer timeline? Yeah, you know, I think on the the premium club area, there are some ideas already in the in the mix before I got here. So we've got a little bit of a head start there, and so we're we're actually activating what a sales process would look like because it would really be a membership type club. It wouldn't necessarily be tied to a seating section. It'd be just access that you could get to on game day, but then we want to activate it on non-game day. There, there's a need for that type of facility. So we might see some construction on that. Maybe if we can do everything right, maybe by summer of next year, summer of 2025 
to be ready by the fall of, of 26. That would be the first most immediate thing. There's also things being done behind the scenes that no one sees. There's a heat tracing process where we have to winterize the stadium to be ready to play games in December. We don't want to host a college football playoff game. We want to be in the top four. But if we are hosting a game, you got to be ready from a winterization standpoint. We're hosting a hockey game, uh, the NHL series, stadium series on March 3rd of 2025. So we're actually doing some infrastructure things right now that a lot of people won't see, but is uh, is part of the process. Twitter user yeah. Shane, the OH, who made that $1.2 billion comment. <laughs> he, he's crunching numbers in his head right now. Numbers. This yeah, winterization yeah. is... is is out of the budget, but That's thanks right. for that answer, Ross. That's yeah, right. that PNL. A great answer, Ross. I, this is terrific. I think really thinking these things through from some interesting perspectives we don't always think about, even things like Safe Light Field. I think that was added a couple years ago, but naming rights on the stadium. And we've talked to a lot of big programs, Ross. This is also not unusual. History is history. Ohio Stadium. But the times are changing. That that naming rights opportunity, fa- fa- the right partner, I think, of more so than a partner I saw just started talking about this. Any development since? Has, has that opened up a little bit more as a new revenue stream potentially? Yeah. Look, I, I made the comment. I, I did not come up with this quote. I'm, I'm not sure who exactly did. But what I said was, you can always honor and preserve history, but we can't think traditionally. Right? And so that that mindset, what I've said is, look, everything has to be on the list. If If economics can now be discussed in a way more transparent manner, And we're really in a commercial entity activity now in college athletics. And we're transparent about all of that. Maybe we haven't been um, in in the history of all of this, but now we are. Then let's put everything on the table to at least evaluate. Let's put every revenue opportunity, every idea, good or bad ideas. Let's put it all on the table. Let's filter it through the right principles, filter it through the setting at the university, the history, all of those things. But we, we can honor tradition, but we cannot think traditionally. Um, and so that's the key part of this. So nothing's been activated. There's been no study conducted. It's just on a long range list of what are all the possibilities? What are all the sort of inventory lists? Uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit that would not be sort of as visible, maybe as a stadium naming rights. Um, we wanna activate those kind of things. So there are some things we can do immediately but that long range planning and putting everything on the table from a commercial activity standpoint, we really have to shift from really just a ticket and a venue driven mindset to a, we're, we're a media company. We're a media entity. We're a commercial activity entity that still has education as a primal experience of what we do, but because of the commercial activity and the need to drive revenue, we have to think differently. And so that's all part of it. That uh, is part of the analysis as I start my tenure here at Ohio State. The Buckeyes fans got to be fired up. This is the new way fans, things are going. Companies like Legends and PlayFi and third parties are coming in to help. A lot of schools are doing this on their own. It's not easy. And they're writing the playbook while they do it. Strong leadership is so important. This is my last revenue question because because I know that this is kind of the new it's the new vibe for ADs nowadays. You've become, you know, basically fundraisers uh, a, a lot of time with it. You mentioned that you dispersed around $20 million in, in NIL, NIL funds last season. Life without a true model is kind of chaotic. Now that the NCA revenue sharing model has started to become a little bit more clear, still very muddy, but a little bit more clear. Do you see, let's use maybe the top 25 recruits because we're looking at the NBA world and some other things where, where where this money's happening relatively quickly, just to get an understanding. Do you see this doubling or tripling, or do you see this new model maybe flattening uh, some of these numbers a little bit so the added revenue share money can actually work in the ways that it's supposed to? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I I, I do think it's a it's a great question and something that you know one we don't have the answer yet to fully, uh, but there's going to be another evolution, right? When NIL first came into be. Right. We thought it was going to be sort of market driven, social media driven. You know, there'd be a marketplace. Somebody would do a camp in their hometown. They get money for that. And then we added our donors and we added collectives that became a buzzword. Right. What is a collective? No one ever heard that term. 
before. And so it really became a lot of booster and a lot of donor activity. And so what I do see is that with this settlement, there's going to, on the NIL space, there's going to be a shift to how do we match make our sponsors and our local companies with the athletes and do that in a very smart and strategic manner because there's going to have to be a fair market value assessment to this. That's that's part of the settlement is that there's going to be some rules of engagement, if you will. I don't think we should limit the marketplace, though. I think the market is the market. And so to me, what does that look like has to be baked out. And then the revenue share bucket that'll come from the institution, I think will give the ability to tell our donors, hey, look, we still need you in an NIL space through your company, but we, we've got this over here. And that, to your point, what that means when we say we have this over here, we still have to develop out. What what team gets what amount of revenue share? I was just with our women's soccer coach a few minutes ago, and I just told her, coach, I don't have all the answers yet. We're going to have traditional financial aid. We're going to have a revenue share category that not all sports will get. And then we'll have an NIL category. And how all those blend together is what we have to map out in this new ecosystem. So it's going to be fascinating. There's a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, but that's the beauty of this is we we get to lean in on this now. We we get some clarity of what the model is for the next, you know, 10 years as the settlement. And now we uh, we do some hard work and, and really map this out, but it, it has to be done because the model needs clarity uh, sooner rather than later. Thanks for leading the charge. You and a group of ADs, uh, very difficult job, but very cool. Excited to see what the future looks like. Athletes, just remember one thing from me. The right partner is always so much more important than a partner in this game uh, over time, I think, as you look back. But very cool. Okay, enough money, enough football. Yeah. I want to talk about Dodge City, and I'm going to pass it over to Rip. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do a how Dodge City are you. I got three questions for you. You ready? Oh, okay. All right, listeners, Dodge City's a uh, it's a it's a cowboy country town. Streets were once walked by White Earp and Doc Holiday type place. So just to give you a vibe yeah. there. Here we go. First one. The Buckeyes are used to Rose Bowls and and championship games and there's a little known NAIA bowl game played at Memorial Stadium in Dodge City from 1970 to 1980. What was the name of that bowl game and who's the only two-time winner? <laughs> Boot Hill Bowl. Yeah. Nice. nice. I don't I don't know who the two time winner is though. Oh, we thought we'd get you on the was bonus. It, Cameron, Cameron University. Cameron, Cameron University. University. Okay. Boot Hill Championship Bowl. Very cool. Nice. Well done. Yeah. Second one. Dodge City has a little under 30,000 people. Let's test your fast food knowledge. This might not be a good one. Some of our ADs don't know fast food because they don't eat fast food. How many McDonald's locations are located in the town? In Dodge City, gosh, it's probably expanded since I was there. Um, when I was there, there was only one. Is there two now? There's two now. Nailed it. Two, now? two for okay. two. There's, we got one on uh, Central Avenue, and there's one on Wyatt Earp Boulevard. Okay. I love that street See, name. The Very one, cool. The one on Wyatt Earp, that, I mean, that was the original one, and then they actually had to come in and tear it down. Uh, we used to uh, we used to cruise Wyatt Earp Boulevard in high school. Of course you did. Of course. What, what was your order at McDonald's when you were cruising? I mean, it was obviously the Big Mac, and usually they had uh, quarter pound, double quarter pounders on special. <laughs> but actually, Burger King right across the street was our spot. It had your Ooh. heart. Because usually we could convince, you know, the people at the window to throw in like an extra order of French fries and stuff like that. So Burger King, we had a few more inside uh, knowledge of uh, the Burger King operation than we did the McDonald's side. Yeah, the hangout spot. Nice. Cool. Wider B Boulevard. Go cruise at Dodge City if you're listening. Take That's a right. cruise tonight. Take Memory Bank. Third one. Last one here. What's the main commercial airline that operates out of Dodge City Regional Airport? Wow. You know what? It's changed. Um, boy, they've had United in there. They've had American. I don't know what it is now. Stick is with your United? gut. United, United Express. United, okay. Okay. This might change. This might. This has changed too. But for bonus points, can you name the biggest city you can get a direct flight from the Dodge City Airport? Denver or Kansas this, City. This man, Rip. This man is Dodge City <laughs> through and through. Three for 100%, three. Hundred percent. Five stars. That's that yeah. last one, DK. We need. We need this last one for our, our Dodge City listeners here. That's that what, last one. What's your best memory or recommendation 
from the Dodge City days, which listeners, this is a 10 day long community festival. This isn't a weekend thing. It's been going on since the 60s. What's your best wreck? The best thing to do at Dodge City Days is buy a, a general admission rodeo ticket, go to the rodeo, and they've got the best beer garden. And you go there, you go to the beer garden, and you see all your friends, you see all the people from Dodge City as sort of the hangout place. And then you can kind of sneak up and watch some of the you know rodeo if you want to. But it's really about just getting in and uh, hanging out at the beer garden and uh, and seeing your friends. That's Inside really info. All about. Now, I'll add another trivia question. What's the what's the town that has two power five ADs from 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 the same hometown? Oh, that's I'm good. going Rick. Dodge City. Is it Dodge, Dodge City? City? So who's wow. the other who's the other power five athletic director from Dodge City? Ward Manuel from Michigan. I'm just kidding. He's he's from uh, easy, New easy. <laughs> um, wait, you, is it is it Ren? I don't know who is it. Travis Golf, University of Kansas. Get out of he's here. also from Dodge City. He's uh he's about seven or eight years younger than me, but we're uh, we're both from Dodge City. It and sounds it's, like it's, it's pretty, sounds like it's, it's time fast. to go back and uh, get an AD. How to be an AD camp going in Dodge City? You guys are producing uh you guys are producing players like uh like like basketball players in Northern Maryland. Amazing, pretty Great. fascinating. So we uh, we have that, uh, and I've known Travis obviously since he was a little kid. I was. I was a teenager probably when I first interacted with him. And then when we got, you know, I got in the business, he got in the business and it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, bond to, to both be from Dodge city and both be power five uh, or power four now, I guess, athletic directors. So there, you can add that to your Dodge city uh, trivia question. Amazing. Yeah. We, maybe we'll get Travis on. I'm sure you guys cross paths in that beer garden at some point. I love that. At some point. That's right. Last little segment here before I know you got to get out of here. We we end every interview with a segment we call one star to five star. DK mentioned we're one stars. Everybody knows it, but we're trying to get a little better each interview with with advice and tips from every guest we have on this podcast, like yourself. So just a few quick ones that run the gamut on a one to five star scale here. You ready? Okay. The Paris Olympics are underway. Started the other day. Now, now there are 24 current, former, and incoming OSU student athletes competing over in France. What's the, let's call it the five-star Olympic event that you always make sure you're watching? Wow. You know, I, I just love track and field. I, I think the competitive nature of it, obviously kind of the heyday of, uh, of Olympic track and field, I think was in the eighties and early nineties, right. When you had uh, Carl Lewis, you know, dominating and Edwin Moses, and it just seemed like, you know, Jackie Joyner, Kersey. And so I, I just, I mean, track and field, is awesome. You know, gymnastics obviously gets a lot of attention now, but I just think the beauty of track and field. I always tell DK that that hundred meter dash final, it's the most amazing 10 seconds in all of sports. It's, it's over in a flash and just the way that stadium goes silent right before the gun is just amazing. Awesome. Track and field. Okay. Moving over uh, to football real quick. Ryan day is 56 and eight in his five seasons as head coach at Ohio state but he's only one in three against Michigan. The three straight losses has been talked about a lot lately on a scale of one to five stars. How much pressure is there on coach to break that losing streak against the Wolverines this year? Yeah. You know, we, we never put numbers on things, right. <laughs> but you know, I've said this, he said it, look, we, we all know what we signed up for. We know the meaning of that game, but the only way that game means something is if you actually do well, the first 11 games. Right. And so there, there's a lot of work to be, to be done. But look, there's no there's no question that the last three years, the way the bowl game went, that's where people said, you know what, we're going to change. We're going to change. And it happened well before I got here. Um, and so Gene Smith dove in, Coach Day dove in, our our supporters dove in and said, look, we, we can't let this happen. And so we'll just leave that as the pressure cooker of saying, look, we know what's at stake. We know the fixes that we've made. And now we just got to deliver. And now we got to perform. So it doesn't matter who said what about the pressure at Ohio State. It's always going to be at the highest level. So whatever grade somebody else wants to give. How about how about that for an answer? A very professional AD answer there. Yeah. Speaking of, we actually... Just by the way the calendar fell, we're actually talking with Ward Manuel tomorrow. Okay. We have an interview okay. with him tomorrow. You have any trash talk for Ward? I know oh, you only Ward been on the job. Whoa, six easy, Rip. Easy. <laughs> Let's see here. I, I got to wait a little bit. Um, <laughs> Ward, Ward, the first time I went to a Big Ten meeting, though, 
I had like a gray sort of coat on and Ward was like, oh, already sporting the gray, huh? And I said, yeah, you got to at least look the part. So I, you, I've known you, Ward uh, since about 2002. So I've known him a long, long time. Last one. Got to close it out with one, one more for the Buckeye fans. You've only been on campus. We mentioned for about six months now, but at least even from where we live on the West coast, we've seen the energy, the loyalty, the commitment of OSU fans from afar, just decade after decade. It truly is Buckeye nation. What's something that you've seen in your initial months on the job that really just exemplifies why OSU fans are so special? Yeah. You know, I mentioned this, uh, but now I, I see it in person. I mentioned this in my press conference that our program is really a public trust if we know the definition of what that is. And so everybody owns it and everybody has a stake in it. And there's so much pride in it. It kind of goes back to the pressure of winning that game, right? There's so much pride and enthusiasm and ownership from Buckeyes who maybe you didn't go to school here, but you grew up in the state. My mom is an example. She grew up in Northwest Ohio. She did not go to school here. This was not attainable uh, for folks in, in her family but they were Buckeyes. And so the fact that it's a public trust and everybody owns a piece of it, I've seen that more and more. And then when you think about that piece of it, it's really a, it's a small town in a big city. It's a small town in an ecosystem that's large. We're the largest fan base. The state's 13 million people. We got all these big cities. We're nationwide to your point, but everybody really wants to maintain the fact that it's a small town. And there's a lot of pride in making sure we protect that. And so the meaning of that is relationships matter. At any place I've been, more so than any place, relationships matter here. And so I've really learned that and, and I'm really taking that to heart that we've got to really, really dive in to that piece of it because of the public trust elements, the relationships, the people. I mean, there's a quote just down the hallway, you know, you win with people. And that was Woody Hayes and then pay it forward. So it's really that mentality and it, it carries, it carries the day in so many things that we do. So it's really been fascinating to, uh, to learn that uh, day to day since I've started. It's amazing to see it. It's the Buckeye state. It's Buckeye nation. Uh, everyone can go follow Ross at Ross Bjork AD on Twitter. Anything you want to know about Ohio state athletics can be found on OhioStateBuckeyes.com. Ross, I know it's been a whirlwind year for you so far. Hopefully this is maybe the, the relaxing month that you get out of the 12. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come on here at One Star Recruits. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me on. All right, heck of an interview. The big game, as we all know this year, DK, is November 30th, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. We'll be watching for sure. Hey, I like this double episode thing. I don't know how many times it's going to work out in the future. It's a, it's a little more work editing and pushing it out to people. But uh, what do you think? I think when it makes sense and we have we have like arch rival athletic directors, absolutely. Pop on Michigan, pop on over to Ohio State. You get a lay of the land, can feel it out, getting ready for the season. Uh, feel like it's a uh, journalist, journalism going on here. What I'm disappointed in the world of journalism, though, Winston pulled me over a list of the top 10 biggest sports rivalries in the world guess what was nowhere to be found what you are over here talking about the biggest game bro is what's happening oh you're talking worldwide though it's a big world out there man i don't know well the, another college football made the list okay you tell me out of these 10 which one are you taking out and putting in ohio ohio state michigan you ready yeah if you don't don't drop any cricket rivalries that, that doesn't count over here no nah, these all seem to be Fairly legit here. We have uh, Chicago Bears versus Green Bay Packers. Okay, accept that. Philadelphia Flyers, Pittsburgh Penguins. Manchester United versus Man City. University of Texas versus Oklahoma, also known as the Red River Rivalry, Shootout, or Showdown. That's the one rip I, I mentioned. FC Barcelona versus Real Madrid. Steelers versus Ravens. Lakers versus Celtics. Cowboys, Eagles. San Francisco Giants, Dodgers, tops the list. Who are you taking out? I mean, the only ones I'm keeping, to be honest, are Manchester United. I'm keeping the Lakers Celtics, and I'm keeping the Dodgers Giants. But to me, Auburn, Alabama should be on there, too. I mean, the, I don't know the history and all these dates that when these started. Maybe Packers, Bears is pretty old, but 
I got to argue that the uh, Ohio State Michigan rivalry dates before the Red River rivalry. Maybe I'm crazy. Do it. Fact check, Winston. I need a fact I'm check. Fact check, Winston, on this on these sources he's sending me over. Sources coming from American uh, Architecture magazine. So <laughs> don't know if the source lines up over here, Winston, too much. But stay in your lane, American Architecture. Stay in your lane, Winston. You know he's getting here messing things up. It's all good. Sports is so necessary to have these interleague rivalries. I know just seeing Golden State and the Golden State Warriors and the the Los Angeles Clippers develop at the, the time that I was working in the NBA. You got to see it start a little bit, kind of phased out a little when when the Clippers went a separate way and the Warriors started to become a dynasty. It doesn't happen all the time is what I'm saying, Rip. It takes a while for these things. We've been trying for our Diamondbacks to get in the rivalry game for 25 years now. Still trying to get that thing going with the Rockies. It's not connecting. One star moments of the week. Let's do them. Let's get right into them. Anything that happened that we don't want to admit, talk about, share with the world. That's what we do. We're one stars. Rip, you got a good one. I know I, I saw you thinking about your one star moment before this podcast. I saw you in the in the corner thinking about it in, in deep thought. Because you had such a good, powerful week celebrating birthdays and laughing and loving. Give me something bad. Yeah, this is kind of a follow-up. I wish uh, I could put my kid in the corner for this. But the follow-up from about a month ago, everyone knows that listens to this podcast, my kid, my six-year-old, five-year-old at the time, keyed a neighbor's car, brand new car, week old Honda CRV, I think. So anyway, it was time to pay the piper this week. It's my one-star moment of the week. Had to drop down. We got actually got it under $2,000, $1,994. Had to throw on the Visa credit card to pay for that. Uh, they had it in the shop for about five days. Came out. I, I went down and looked at it. It looks amazing. These body shops do amazing work. But $1,994 down the drain from a five-year-old keying a car with a rock for no reason. Well, there was a reason, but it's a five-year-old reason. So one star moment of the week. I'm two thousand dollars poorer, DK. Mm. Makes two of us. If it makes you feel any better, did I tell you? Or did I bring this up about my my car situation? You keyed a car? No key. No kid king. No king. Completely uh, human grade uh, adult male making a mistake. Made a very tight left turn into a beach parking lot in Hawaii. We uh, beach parking lots have. They don't want you doing crazy turns in and out. So a lot of them have these kind of yellow entryway. I don't know what you call them, stanchions to uh, keep the flow of the parking lot going one car at a time. And I took it tight and I dented the side of, of my my truck of the of the Tundra, pressed it right on in the gas tank, put a hole above the uh, left back tire over the uh, cover. What do you call that thing that covers the wheel? Wheel cover. <laughs> Sure. Hatch, wheel hatch, whatever. Still drivable. Still will pass safety checks. Still fine. However, big dent. Been bad paint. It's yellow now. Took it into the shop here in Hawaii. Not only will it take four months to get the part, they need the whole side of the door. Quote at man hours, $5,500 when it was all said and done. Oh, Shopped around to uh, local paint and dent repair guys. On the island, there is one human being who does this. <laughs> Was able to get to him. Fairly nice guy, but very obviously he knows that he has has the negotiating power in his current situation of job choice on the island of Kauai. And uh, he's able to do the job. It will take 10 hours. And uh, I was able to get out of there for $1,800 was the quote for the dent to be popped out and the paint to be touched up. So the truck looks fairly not beat up. So completely self-imposed. No child, no rock. Uh, 100% adult move by me that I'm responsible. So maybe that will make you feel better, bro. Wow. That's that's a one. So something must be in the air on this podcast with both damaging cars here. Is it something that you could just keep driving the car with? Like, do you care that much yeah. about it? Well, no, I can keep driving the car. However, uh, the car happens to be on loan from a good friend of mine who lives on the mainland. And uh, that's just not how you return loans. I got to no. take care of it. Yeah. yeah leave you it know? better than you found it, right? Leave it better. And I tried to make a pitch to him. You know, we had a nice conversation. My guy, Keith Lee, is the guy who I did that to hike from hell with. He, uh, I told him, you look more like a local to, when you have this stuff on your truck. It's actually a bigger sign of respect. He didn't, wasn't interested in that. Concept. He tried the sales job. I gave it a go, man. It wasn't really worth it. But hey, we're all in it together, bro. Things happen. Money comes, money goes. So don't feel too bad, Rip. One star moment there. One star moment for me. That could be it. I'm going to one star moment my wife. Though, because this one's this one this one's on Miss Kimmy. 
tried a new recipe. I decided I wanted to try a shrimp recipe. Shrimp's not something I do too often. I don't know how often shrimp's done at your household. Are you doing shrimp often? Once a year, max. It's a very rare thing. I don't know why, really, but once you start doing it, it's a lot of process. You got to do a lot of stuff. Clean them, shell them, devein them, do all the stuff. And then, you know, you cook them and then it's a risky cook. You can very quickly overcook them. You can maybe undercook them. I don't know what that looks like. What happened in this particular situation was I got a couple couple pounds of delicious jumbo shrimps. We were ready. We're going to make shrimp and pasta, a little garlic, a little shrimp scampi pasta. Wife who's in charge of the shrimps, all of them cleaned, ready to go. I said, those all got the poop thing out of it, poop thing. She said, they are already were cleared out before. They already did it. Make all the shrimps. Serve delicious pasta. Wonderful. Garlic, onions, un powder, some delicious chili powder, parsley, ready to go. First shrimp in. Big old inner shrimp poo lining poo. First one, second one, right there. Third, all of the shrimps, Rip, still had the poo in them. We didn't even eat them. I was too grossed out. She was too grossed out. We dumped them. You eat the shrimps when they don't get de pooed? How do you miss something like that? She, That's she what told I'm you saying. That's what I'm saying. And how did I not double check, though, as the resident chef of my house? So I take responsibility. But I also give it, give it to her on that one. Those I thought it... I thought it could be a situation where you could pull out post cook and you kind of can pull them, but not really, but you're grossed out by the end of it anyway, at that situation. So yeah, 30 bucks, flush it down the drain, add it to my truck cost. So I'm in 2000 plus shrimp and truck. I don't know, man. Sh shrimp are not cheap these days. I might throw some olive oil and salt on that and just uh, treat it as a delicacy. Damn. Just eat it like a, like a, like a, like a foreskin. You know, or like a, like a, no, Rip, it's not, it's not an edible. That thing you're supposed to eat. Put some salt on it, he said. One star moments, though. One star recommendations. Let's do good stuff. This good stuff happens too. Usually when we, we, we recommend them to the world, I'll start. I've fully done it, man. I've committed a full transition, 100%. I've been talking about it for a while. Uh, but I've been, it's been very difficult to lose the last final part of this complete transition. And it could be to your de detriment, Rip, at the, at, the, at the end of it, but it's going to be the better for my mental health. So I'll accept all congratulations, man, on a full transition. Transition of what? I have now become a member of the dumb phone gang. I'm a dumb phone user. I've cleared and gutted all apps and services on my cell phone. I'm left with maps, a Google browser, two fantasy football apps. Those are very important. My camera and text. I'm out. I deleted. I was, I LinkedIn and X had me still on and X was stealing time from my life on my phone in particular. Not anymore, bro. I'm done being a damn sheep and sitting in my cell phone on a beautiful summer day. I'm done standing in line at a restaurant waiting for my table and balls deep in X looking at what's happening with, with cotton candy burritos at Chase Field. I'm done, Rip. I'm out of here. I'm talking to people and I'm being a human and I'm now a dumb phone user and I'm out. Now, do I still have X on my laptop? Do I still have a couple other apps, Zillow, a couple other ones on my laptop? Yes, but it's like putting the candy in the pantry and maybe in a lockbox. The effort of going up there and getting it and finding it sometimes is not worth the price of eating that candy, bro, if you know what I mean. So that's it. I've done it. I'm a dumb phone user. I've cleared my phone of everything. I've gone from four hours in the two days I've done it of screen time, four hours and 30 minutes, what I've averaged this month, down to less than 30 minutes. Okay, so that, that's your actual one-star moment of the week, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 give it, I give it 30 days, and you'll be back. No, uh, I told my wife, I told my wife, I we did a, a written contract. I said, I will not put anything on my cell phone, any apps on my cell phone until the end of 2024, or I will write you a $10,000 check. It's signed. It's right here on the table. You got Apple Podcasts on there? I still got Apple Podcasts. I still got Spotify. 
All right. I guess that's all yeah. that matters. I'm still in the game with you, Rip. I still got on my computer. I just, it's just not serving me, bro. And it's so clear right in front of my face. It's not serving me. It's, it's, and it became the, it's such an addiction that when I got the apps off my phone, I spent two days like a damn ghost. Like I would pick up my phone, scroll the spot on my homepage that it usually was and hit it without even noticing it. So, so you don't even have a second screen like to swipe over to. They're all that you have less apps correct. than, wow. Correct. I'm, I'm like I'm like four swipes. On you're my four phone. swipes. You're four swipes deep. I all of that, all of that cleared out. WhatsApp, everything, Zillow, it's all gone. It's this is the the, the dumbest phone ever. But I'm going to get my directions, and I'm so stupid that I keep two fantasy football apps because, yes, I'm fully addicted to fantasy football. It, there it is. Sign me up for fantasy football AA because uh, those are not going anywhere. I can tell you that much. Well, um, I expect more than a seventh place finish finish from you this year. And it, oh boy, uh, oh boy, I got some plans. Don't I'm you glad worry. you got your map so you still know how to get to Laughlin on August thirtieth. So uh, I'll see you there, buddy. For the we'll see you there, big boy. Thanks for your support on that one, though. But that's it. That's a real thing. I don't know if other people are are, are uh, th that's a thing happening out in society nowadays, or pe other people are thinking about that. And I know it's also not very doable too with lifestyles and things you have going on. Probably your kids' activities are attached to apps nowadays, Rip. So I'm not doing a one-upper or a brag here. It's a recommendation to access more time in your day, which is the one asset that money can't buy. I'll be interested to see how that goes over the next month. You'll be back. I say you'll be back. I got I I was I thought my recommendation of the week was going to be good for you, but now I don't even I don't think you have the HBO app. It's every year this time. I think it's the fourth straight year. It's Hard Knocks. It's always Hard Knocks. Tonight is the premiere. Actually, Tuesday we're recording this eight six August six is the premiere of Hard Knocks. The Chicago Bears. Caleb Williams, Keenan Allen. I don't even know any other players on the team. Montez Sweat. Let's go Bears. But yeah, Hard Knocks is always a must watch for me. I'll definitely have it have it watched by the end of the week. Despite all the Olympics and everything else, despite the four screens of apps on my phone, I'm still going to find time to watch Hard Knocks. So, yeah, everybody check it out. Give us some feedback. We love Hard Knocks on this show and I'll be watching. I'm watching Rip. I still got the apps on this on the TV. I didn't have a, I didn't say I got a dumb TV, just a dumb phone. I'm ah, watching. Okay. Good. I'm, all right. There we go. Yeah. Come on. I love Hard Knocks. I'm one of those guys. I just this is a it's a sign of a, the beginning of the football season. It's sacrilegious to miss miss and and. This Bears team is a, is a, an exciting team. We got a lot of unknowns here that we need to decipher before our Laughlin fantasy football draft coming up. Good stuff, Rip. Good one star Rex, man. Hit the music. Let's do some Rips reacts. All right, all right, all right. USA fencing. It's been the best in history for the team at the Olympics, Rip. They secured four medals. They got uh, a lot of TV time. I'm hearing people who don't even like sports talking about how excited they were watching the finals of the damn fencing match on the Olympics. Rip, you are the new owner of the Long Beach professional fencing team. Newest member of the NFL, National Fencing League. What's the name of your team and the logo? I'm going Long Beach fence jumpers, and it's just going to be a chain link fence. The logo is a fence. Is it the right fencing I'm talking about? I tried to watch that thing the other day. I saw a five-second <laughs> clip. I just saw two people run into each other, and then one was declared the winner. I have no idea. If I'm rich enough to own anything, I'm delegating all those tasks to somebody else. I, I have no patience for fencing. The fence jumper is kind of funny. We just make the assumption that it's a, a fence. It's a pun. Your whole sports ownership career is a pun, Rip. A joke. <laughs> this is chain link fence, baby. American <laughs> Supply Company. Team USA three on three basketball. Huge disappointment. The women's team. They recovered from a 03 start. They got a bronze medal, so they medaled. However, Rip, however, the men took a terrible loss. Didn't even medal. Sounds like sounds like the NBA has some contractual stuff between players not being able to participate in three on three. So that's not the solution. Let's throw that one out the window. Rip. Please solve the three-on-three -three basketball problem for the United States. 
Well, I think the answers probably come from the deficiencies this year. I didn't watch much of it, but I know I, I know some of the players, Kareem Maddox, Jimmer Fredette, who's on this podcast, and also Kanye Berry. And it might have been a different result if Jimmer didn't hurt his groin, I believe, in the second game, because they were the number one ranked team, I believe, in the world going into the Olympics and, and for most of last year. So it could have been a different outcome. Maybe there are no deficiencies, but I think uh, between now and the next four years, they're going to get it right. I, I anticipate USA will win gold in, that, in 2028 in L.A. You didn't even give real any real solutions. NBA guys, college guys, you, you do a you do a something off the street. How do you get the players? You're no, you keep... just you, you learn from your failures. And, and if if a failure includes your best player getting injured, then that's not really a failure. That just happened. So you Here's run it back saw. in four years. Here's what I saw. I saw you can talk about these guys playing together for 20 years and being better athletes. I saw a creative player prototype on these other teams, Slovenia. Germany, they are skinnier, taller, and more physical. Jimmer and Canyon are not it. They need to be a different type of body type and player. That's my hot take, and I don't have an exact answer, and I think you can pull guys from the basketball tournament, to be honest with you, and just train them all year. We don't need shooters. Look at this, Look at some of these other teams. They look like creative players. They all look real similar and play real similar, and we got pushed around is what it felt like to me. We got out-muscled by skinny dudes. We'll see. This guy removes all apps from his phone and watches every single sport in the Olympics. <laughs> have, you missed any, have you missed a minute of the Olympics? Jesus, fencing, three-on-three, three, women. What's going on here? Savannah Bananas, dude, it's happening. We had it first. We called this shit. We knew it was coming, man. The, the baseball team, they snuck into a media right field, Rip. They have done it, bro. TNT. Friday nights. They're doing national broadcasts on Friday nights on True TV and TNT beginning on August 16th. I think we were a part of this, to be honest with you, Rip. We had these, this idea very, very early. Wrestling meets baseball has now found a Friday night landing spot. It all makes sense. Rip, will this Friday night baseball get any Nielsen rating at the Rip household? I'll tune in. I mean, I, I like to expose my kids to fun stuff like that. And hey, they make baseball fun. Uh, baseball, as we all know, is a little bit boring, even with the pitch clock and all the new rules to speed up the game. But the Savannah Bananas, our guy Jesse Cole, man, former one-star recruit, he's been doing it everywhere. They're playing in Major League Parks. They got a, a national tour, possibly a world tour. Now they're on TNT. Congrats to him. Kudos to the Bananas. We'll definitely tune in for that. And I have a great idea, Rip. I sent you my last phone direct message to my good friend rip on x was a costco uh, item which i sent you which happened to be a prefabricated bar garage sold at costco that i thought would be the perfect fucking fit for your new batting cage new idea right now we reach out to jesse because we're homies with him he's been on the podcast before can listen back to it he's so good maybe they want to sponsor that purchase put their logo on the bar maybe we have a Local neighborhood, Savannah Bananas, Bar Garage, slash Batting Cage, sponsored by the Bananas. How's that sound? It's always touchy when you're involved in alcohol. Are we talking uh, non-alcoholic drinks here? But yeah, I mean, if they can scale that idea, I'm sure they'd be into it. But come on, one Batting Cage and and Long You're right, alcohol, the neighborhood, but you need the dads have a place to chill. Yeah, maybe you just start Diet Coke or something. Idea. That's an idea alert. Sometimes I do that. Last one. I got to bring it up, man, because it happened. The Seine River. It was a scene. Another Olympic event was disrupted by the poor quality, but they put the damn decathlon people in there. Two left with E. coli. One had to leave the thing. Um, the training, some said they were training swimming in sewer and food water for the months before leading up to this. The competition is, they're still they are still doing it, Rip. These, a poor Belgium had to pull out because he had full E. coli going on from swimming in this, this damn river. Rip's reacts. Last time, Rip, how much money for you to take a full gulp of water from that river? Man, I'd say uh, probably... How many euros? 175 euros, I'd do it. <laughs> what, a, what a son I'll of a I'll take my chances. Kiwanis Park in Tempe or, or the, the Seine River in Paris, which is which has worse water quality? Oh, the Salt River, man. Both, both. I mean, that's just irrigation. 175 euros, man. That's two croc masseurs. Rick rips in. One-star recruits. Thank you. Thank you, Michigan. Thank you, Ohio State fans. Enjoy this rivalry. Have a wonderful time hating each other. 
And if you have any love in your hearts, go give us five stars. Leave a note. Really helps with the algorithm. We'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>